Well, let's start. We're delighted to have with us today uh, two of our illustrious graduates, uh, Jacqueline DeLeon and Marina Jenkins. Uh, Jacqueline is an enrolled member of the Isleta Pueblo. Uh, she's a staff attorney uh, at, the Nash at the Native American Rights Fund, uh, and we're going to hear more about her work. Uh, she holds a JD from Stanford. She graduated from Princeton. Uh, she worked uh, at a large law firm after graduation, Wilmer Hale. Uh, she also clerked uh, for the District of New Jersey in the United States District Court for the District of New Jersey and for the Alaska uh, State Supreme Court. Marina Jenkins is a director of litigation and policy at the National Redistricting Foundation. She uh, worked prior to joining NRF at Jenner and Block, uh, where she focused on government controversies, public policy litigation, and election law. She was also a law clerk uh, for the United States Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia. Uh, hint, hint, this is a good thing to do a clerkship. All students should take note. Uh, she's a graduate from Stanford Law School and also a graduate of Princeton University. So thank you both for being here. Uh, I think we should probably start with just a bit of your biography. Uh, and in both cases, I think one of the questions people would want to know is, uh, Marina, how did you go from Jenner and Block uh, to the National Redistricting Foundation? And then Jacqueline, how did you transition from Wilmer Hale to being an attorney at the Native American Rights Fund. So uh, Jacqueline, please uh, tell us about your path. Sure, hi everyone. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Professor Banks for this great discussion and Marina. We have similar paths, Marina. And so <laughs> I'm so excited to, to finally uh, meet you. And um, it's so good to be back among the Stanford uh, crowd. And I'm sorry that I, we can't be there in person, but it's, it's nice to be back uh, uh, with, with Stanford. Um, so after uh, law school, I clerked uh, those two years and then went to Wilmer Hale's DC office looking for litigation experience. And probably on a more personal note, looking for just continual striving for those bona fides, you know, just always trying to say that I'm a qualified uh, minority woman. Um, and I feel that, uh, you know, so I did that for four years in their an international antitrust um, and some litigation work until uh, my husband and myself decided um, that we wanted to move back west. And at the time, I started really looking into what I actually wanted to do, uh, which was uh, to work on behalf of Native Americans. Um, and at the time, just fortuitously, there was a staff attorney opening um, at the Native American Rights Fund, which is really my dream job. I have no intention of leaving this job. I feel that I've been working my way up uh, just to feel qualified for this job. Um, and so, uh, you know, now that I've got it, I have no intention of leaving and uh, really love uh, the work that I do. Um, Sorry, Marina, you're, you're, what was your path? How, how did you transition from Jenner and Block? And, you know, had you always planned to make the change or was it something that happened in practice that made you think about making a change? Sure. I think um, looking back on it, it, this seems sort of like all meant to be and um, like, you know, according to some grand plan. Um, I graduated in, from Stanford in 2010. Uh, so during the last census year and redistricting. Um, redistricting was something and the census were, were things that I was interested in, um, just generally with an interest in voting rights. Um, but I also uh, knew that I was going to be graduating with some obligations to pay back, <laughs> uh, to pay down my loans. And, and uh, I had my, you know, long before I owned a home, uh, had my, what I, what I consider my first mortgage, which is my education. Yay. Um, <laughs> uh, so I knew that I, that I was going to go to a firm. Um, I had actually worked at a law firm as a legal assistant for three years in between college and law school, understanding that this was sort of the reality and, and, um, trying to get my feet wet a little bit, um, in, in private practice. And so, uh, when I was looking at firms, um, Jenner uh, stuck out to me because uh, they had 
um, what seemed like really interesting uh, work in the private sector, but also um, had an election law practice. Um, a lot of that work was done on a pro bono basis. And so um, spent a long time, a lot of my time at Jenner, probably more than they would have liked, uh, doing pro bono work and, and focusing on my, my voting rights practice and election law practice. Um, and and um, through doing that, you know, building relationships with folks, getting really good experience um, in that in that universe. And so um, I actually did things, I did my clerkship a little bit out of, uh, out of step. So I um, clerked when I was sort of uh, four and five years out of, uh, I was, or five and six. So I uh, clerked from 2015 to 2016. So I'd been at the firm for a number of years, went and clerked, and then went back to the firm. Um, and when I returned uh, to the firm that next year, I sort of knew, you know, it was it was time for me to sort of uh, reach, reach out for something that I was more passionate about um, and to sort of, um, you know, understanding that I could not only do my pro bono work uh, from the firm. And so I uh, just started looking for opportunities and uh, when this one came about, uh, it did seem uh, very fortuitous. Uh, you know, that redistricting is something that I am, I've long been interested in. And so um, being able to join that team, um, which at the time was very much on the ground floor. Um, uh, and so uh, I've almost been there for three years now. So it's been, um, it's been really great. Okay, wonderful. And I should, should say just the other day, yesterday I was actually working on a, a recommendation letter for a student and I opened up my recommendation letter folder and I found a Marina Jenkins recommendation letter from 2014. <laughs> Did she graduate before that though? And but so I know. this answered my question uh, yeah. about why that clerkship letter was in 2014. Yes. But, uh, and it was such a good letter that you should have gotten a clerkship. Um, <laughs> and it was also all true. So it was very good for me to, to read it again. <laughs> Uh, anyway, so Jacqueline, so you, you are both, we wanted to have you together because you're really both focused on some of the crucial issues in our society, which is how to make democracy work uh, and how to make democracy work for all people so that we can sustain this democratic project and have it be, and, and that we can move it closer to our aspirations uh, rather than not. Uh, Jacqueline, could you uh, say a bit about what are the, the challenges, and I want to talk about specific cases later, but what are the challenges that you're working on uh, in voting rights for Native Americans? Yeah, so um, when I joined NARF a few years ago, I was really fortunate to be assigned to their voting rights practice group and led co-led a series of field hearings across Indian country, nine in total, um, where we asked over 100 witnesses, you know, what's keeping you from voting? We know voting rights are really low. You know, why is it that voting rights are so low in Indian country? And we heard from, you know, community members, tribal, or, tribal members, um, community organizers, tribal leaders, um, academics, politicians, really just anybody that could speak to voting. And what emerged was, I think, a really remarkably consistent picture um, that eventually <laughs> we laid out in a lengthy report <laughs> um, at NARV. Um, and what we found is that it's just really hard. It's still really hard to vote in Indian country in ways I think that would be shocking to the average American. So we've seen, we've gotten a little bit of introduction to this. You know, I think we saw really long polls in Georgia, uh, you know, really long li lines um, to, to get to the polling place. And people are starting to realize that, that, that elections officials can make it difficult to vote. And we found that that's consistently true in Indian country. So people have to travel 20 to 40 miles off the reservation to vote. There's just not that many polling locations on the reservation, despite there really being no reason for that. Um, and you know, it requires transportation, which given the poverty levels uh, in Indian country, many people don't have. Uh, we saw registration opportunities were limited. We saw that um, really, Native Americans aren't getting the type of outreach uh, from either political party to participate uh, in the system. And then we saw just really kind of structural problems that make it more difficult to vote. So, for example, Native Americans lack residential street addresses on many of their homes. Uh, so then when we shift to all vote by mail, uh, it makes it extremely difficult for Native Americans to actually utilize that system. So I spent a lot of time, uh, we've done a, a big education campaign. Um, over the last few years on top of the litigation, uh, the education campaign, just to let people know that it's really hard to vote in Indian country. 
Um, and then I should also just mention in the list of things that are hard, I want to not leave out the overt racism that's occurring in Indian country, because um, I think that is something that needs to be noted. So for example, counties, um, counties are often, you know, really local elections officials that, you know, stem from uh, people that come from, you know, descendants of settlers, people that have long-standing hostilities uh, towards Native Americans. And so we saw overt racism, like, you know, making Natives vote out of a repurposed chicken coop, uh, making the polling locations for Native Americans sheriff's offices, um, making, you know, really just kind of hostility when Native Americans go in to vote. So we saw, we saw a lot of overt racism. Right. Anyway, that's all a long way of saying there's a lot of barriers uh, to voting. And so my work is about educating people about those barriers. And then we do engage in quite a bit of litigation when we think it's necessary. Okay. And, and how would you, you, you alluded to this, but how would you um, sort of apportion the, the motivation for these different barriers? Uh, to what extent is it a matter of indifference versus partisan motivation versus pure racial motivation? So I think that all of them have a piece of the pie, right? Um, I think that indifference or neglect is probably um, the, is, 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 is really looms large because I think a lot of times counties don't understand their obligations to Native Americans because Native Americans have sovereignty. They, in a lot of arenas, are engaging in their own self-governance. And so the county is sometimes not responsible for Native Americans in some aspects of their responsibilities. And so then when it comes time um, as a state official to give uh, tribes, tribal members who are also state citizens and also county citizens access to voting, sometimes they can neglect that responsibility um, out of a misunderstanding or out of just unfamiliarity uh, or even intimidation, right? They don't know how to engage with the tribe. Um, and then there's also, like I said, a lot of overt racism where officials just feel um, hostility towards Native Americans uh, and um, they feel that Native Americans shouldn't be entitled to resources. Um, for example, they think that Native Americans don't pay taxes. That's not true, but you know, they've got these kind of um, deep-seated feelings that make them feel like Native Americans shouldn't participate. We heard a lot things like they've got their system, we've got our system, they don't need to uh, participate in our system, even though Americans are, or Native Americans are American citizens. Uh, so that kind of um, disregard is, is pretty active. And then, you know, politically, um, obviously NARF is nonpartisan, but it's not, it's not uh, partisan to say that, for example, the case we litigated out of North Dakota um, was I think primarily motivated by partisan um, kind of uh, motivations there. So Heidi Heitkamp won election, um, at, surprise election out of, out of North Dakota uh, uh, in 2012, um, based largely on Native American turnout. And in 2013, they enacted the voter ID law that had a residential street ad address yeah. requirement mm -hmm. when Native Americans did not have a residential street address. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, part of that was longstanding hostilities towards Native Americans, and part of that was a partisan reaction uh, to Native Americans flexing their political power. Okay, great. And and Marina, you're you're approaching uh, political participation from a in a in a different setting. You're focused on redistricting litigation generally. Could you say something about that? And what are the what are the issues there? And what are the what are the challenges that that you're confronting? Um. I think you know redistricting is a a a super wonky area, but um, but ultimately at the end of the day, it's just about sort of allocation of representation. And so um, one of the reasons that that I have um, been interested in it and find it so interesting is basically how we set up this system uh, impacts how. Uh, decisions are made. So if you have um, a system that is set up to reflect, uh, to uh, translate the will of the voters, then you end up having policies that reflect the will of the voters. If you have a system that is set up to uh, warp uh, what the voters might want to happen or, or distort the, uh, the different voting, the sort of relative voting power of, of voters within the state, um, then you will end up with a distorted uh, set of policies that don't actually reflect what people want. Um, and so that's sort of the, the driving force of, um, 
the work that we do and, and particularly in this year in this environment, we have expanded um, to do, you know, election administration work as well and sort of taking that same ethos of looking at systems and figuring out, you know, is this a system that uh, that communicates the will of the voter and puts it into practice, or is it a system that that um, sort of gets in the way and obstructs? And so, uh, you know, certainly, you know, partisan gerrymandering is has been in the news a, a lot over the past several years. Um, we have been litigating the maps from the last decade, even up to 2019. Um, uh, uh, racial gerrymandering, similarly, uh, so I think our racial gerrymandering case, our la final racial gerrymandering case from the last decade concluded in um, June 2018. Um, and so with new maps in place for the 2019 elections uh, in Virginia, um, section two has been, you know, is a real uh, uh, sort of, um, there, there's a lot of ground to cover in terms of um, what section two requires for uh, representation for uh, minority communities to be able to elect the candidates of their choosing and ensure that there is adequate. Let me, let me stop you there for a moment. Could you, because we're, I don't want to get ahead of the audience here. Could you take us back to, so, so Jacqueline, you're focused on uh, individuals being able to vote, right? And I think we can all understand how that can be a uh, a bad thing for democracy if individuals are not permitted to vote. But Marina, you're focused on the aggregation of voters into districts and gerrymandering is a, is a bad way to do that. Can you tell us though, how does, what is gerrymandering and how does that translate or, or into racial inequity in terms of political participation? What's the, what, what's the injustice there? Sure. So um, the way that, uh, so for example, take a con our congressional maps. So every 10 years, there is a census um, and uh, the, the seats in the US House of Representatives are uh, what's called reapportioned. And so they are reallocated among the states. Um, and there's basically a methodology that decides how many seats each state gets. Um, and so, for example, and I'll just sort of use a, a, a made up state, but so if, if um, your state gets 10 seats, then the state legislature or sometimes a commission is responsible for um, dividing up the state into 10 districts. And how you do that, how you draw lines um, uh, between, between people, between communities um, can make a big difference. And so it, you might have um, a state where with 10 districts, you might have you know, a, a state with 30% uh, African-American population, but you know, the way that they are able to draw the district Make sure that only one, you know, one out of ten of those seats is is a is a district where um, the African American community is able to um, elect a candidate of their choosing, and so, okay. and that's the the sort of section two, the underlying section two question is um, uh, is that you know what is the what is the p power of those communities, and so you the sort of terminology. Um, for, ger for gerrymandering that we focus on a lot is either cracking or packing. So either you're splitting up communities um, that could coalesce together to, um, as Jacqueline was saying, flex their political muscles, or you are, um, and so you're splitting them up so that they don't have as much power because they can't act collectively, or you're packing a community. Mm -hmm. um, and so you're, you're drawing sort of all of the people who you think, um, you know, might otherwise be able to spread out their power and be able to work and get sort of a broader um, uh, basis on which to, to flex their political muscles um, and, and putting them all into one district. So you're sort of limiting and minimizing the ability of that community to, um, to have a voice in the in the uh, either in the house delegation or likewise in the state um, state legislative chambers. But you might, if I'm tracking, so you might dilute the power of a, of a group through either cracking, splitting the group into different districts, say, and not giving them a majority in any district, or by packing them all into one district. So they're going to have overwhelming power in that district, but then no power in the other district. Yeah, absolutely. And so it is a it, while it is a structural, you know, we focus on the structure and the systems. It is there is an injury on it, the individual voter. Okay, and when you refer to, to Section Two, I think you're referring to the Voting Rights Act of 1965. Uh, and Jacqueline, could you, which is a landmark voting reg, uh, legislation, it made real, many would say, uh, the Fifteenth Amendment uh, enacted a century earlier. Uh, Jacqueline, do you is the is the Voting Rights Act is that a uh, uh, how useful is that to you in your uh, litigation is that is that the the basis on which you uh, litigate? 
Oh yeah, so so the Voting Rights Act is our bread and butter. I mean, section two is, you know, the cases that we're bringing um, over and over again. Um, and uh, yeah, so I mean, Native Americans likewise you know, received the, the right to franchise later than everybody else, not till 1924 were they um, considered citizens. And then uh, there were the states like much like uh, other uh, minority groups enacted um, uh, state laws to keep Native Americans from voting. And it wasn't until the Voting Rights Act that uh, Native Americans were fully enfranchised and had a mechanism for enforcing their rights. So we still uh, rely on um, the Voting Rights Act um, and we often allege uh, unintentional, dis you know, just discrimination uh, that doesn't have to be proven uh, as intentional. Uh, and then also increasingly um, given sort of uh, the state of uh, the state, the facts that we come up Cross, we're alleging intentional discrimination as well. Okay, so the um, uh, Marina, you your group though, could you say a little bit more about the uh, National Redistricting Foundation and your your methods of attacking these problems? Because you know Jacqueline's group engages in in direct litigation, uh, mm -hmm. where you are the lawyers, but the National Redistricting Foundation has a different relation to litigation, I believe. Right? Could you say something about your model of change? Sure. Um, so we uh, are a small operation. Um, I am um, somewhat of an in-house counsel role. So um, from the foundation, we determine cases that we want to either pursue affirmatively or um, places where we think that we ought to get involved. We work with outside counsel. Um, so we sort of engage outside counsel to develop new cases um, in where, where we are, you know, think that we need to, um, where we can add value and where we would like to add value and we would like to sort of be involved in, and um, be engaged. And so uh, my role is, uh, it's a litigation management role that might be similar to sort of an in-house role at um, uh, another kind of, you know, I guess more more frequently maybe a, a private sector role that would come to mind. But um, because, you know, we are uh, financing cases, we develop them and then provide strategic guidance. So making sure that ultimately, you know, any sort of move that is made within the context of litigation is sort of in line with our vision of, of why we brought the case to, and, and what we're planning to do. Um, we work a lot with other organizations as well. So we'll, we'll um, partner with an organization who might want to be um, the plaintiff in the case. And so the foundation is not a party to the suit, but we'll be um, funding, funding it um, and working closely with the organizational plaintiffs or individual voters who are plaintiffs in, in the case. Interesting. And so you're mostly in a, in a coordination and funding role rather than in a litigation role. That's right. And, and what, and this is an organization that was just, that was created just a few years ago. Uh, and what happens after the redistricting process uh, and after the census redistricting process occurs? Do you continue with this work in light of the next one or what? Yeah, so um, I, I think, you know, certainly the organization is not going to disappear. Uh, we will we will be uh, cyclical as as needs are um, are met and as they reduce. <laughs> so, you know, right now, certainly we are we are gearing up. Um, the, the organization is growing. Um, so from the foundation, we also work with um, our affiliated organizations. Um, so the National Redistricting Foundation is a C3, a 501c3 organization. Um, we have an affiliate 501c4 organization and then um, are also affiliated with the National Democratic Redistricting Committee, um, which- could you, could you explain for listeners what those different designations mean briefly, C3, C4? Yes, sorry. <laughs> Um, so uh, it's a it's a tax status, but effectively it means that from where I sit, uh, managing litigation that is done through our 501c3 it is nonpartisan work. Um, it is anti gerrymandering work. It is um, it is voting rights work. Um, our 501c4 affiliate does grassroots advocacy, so they um, you know are issue oriented, advocacy um, oriented, and so and then the. Um, uh, the NDRC, uh, of which our uh, former Attorney General Eric Holder is chairman, um, they are sort of the political entity and um, uh, work to get pro 
uh, fair maps, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, candidates elected and um, support uh, reforms uh, that, that will help um, alleviate some of the problems that we've seen, um, particularly in the past 10 years in redistricting. Okay. So, so the C4 can engage in politically oriented activity, but the C3 cannot. That's right. Is that the divide? Okay. So it's litigation and public education primarily. Okay, so I should should note now that if, if any of the listeners have any questions, you can send a chat directly to the panelists. Um, there are no bad questions. Uh, we want to be sure that everyone is kind of moving along with this. When people when we talk about Section Two and Five Hundred One C Three, some people may may be lost, and that's okay. But just let us know if you are. Okay, now um, I want I can't r r resist. Um, talking and we can, I want to give you guys a chance to talk some about your, your current cases, but to talk about this current election um, and the political challenges we confront because you've each had, uh, you know, recent challenges and some victories, uh, I'm happy to say, uh, that will potentially impact the current uh, election and, the, and voting in just uh, a month or so. So Jacqueline, could you go first and then Marina, but tell us about what you see as a, the challenges that loom largest now, how you're confronting them, uh, and to the extent to which you've had success. Yeah, so our, we had some longer litigation that just resolved itself. And our litigation was around, uh, primarily around um, ballot collection. So there's this boogeyman out there, uh, this idea that ballot harvesting is coming for um, everyone to cast fraud and illegitimate, illegitimacy on the election. Um, but in fact, uh, what we find in Native American communities is that ballot, what you know is called ballot harvesting is just ballot collection. And what that is, is just called picking up and dropping off mail in Native communities. And that's because uh, Native Americans don't have residential mail delivery at their homes, and so they have to travel to a distant post office that's open limited hours uh, to access a PO box that's shared with 10 to 15 people. Mm -hmm. And so as a regular course of business, they're picking up and dropping off mail for each other, including ballots. Um, and we won a res in uh, Montana uh, recently, there was a state initiative um, uh, to, uh, on, on their, uh, to ban ballot collection there um, that was overturned um, in state court. We just received um, a, a, a victory there. And uh, the court, I think, had a pretty remarkable opening paragraph where she noted that, you know, when we're making rules, we can't uh, just make rules based on our own experiences. We actually have to look at the facts of what other people's lives uh, entail. And uh, for Native Americans, that entails uh, difficulty accessing mail. And so ballot collection is a reasonable way for them to um, conduct their affairs. Um, the other uh, case was in Nevada, where we intervened there because um, they had issued some em emergency legislation to allow for ballot collection. And um, the, Dem the Trump campaign and um, uh, the Republican National Committee had brought suit trying to challenge those emergency legislations. And so we sought to intervene in that case um, to show the Native American perspective. And that case was dismissed for a lack of standing. Um, so also considered a victory. Um, and then we have other cases, like we finished up last year, the North Dakota ID case, which was like a six year North endeavor um, and some other cases. Uh, but in the short term, in the immediate term, what we're doing right now is sending a series of threatening letters to county officials that are not putting in their in-person polling locations right now. So they're trying to hard shift to all vote by mail and um, which is understandable in COVID, but not again, they're not putting in in-person locations. Yeah, so they're just denying in-person polling locations saying that COVID makes it uh, too difficult. You know, they don't have the personnel or they don't have, um, uh, or they don't want to put in-person polling locations. So they're just gonna move entirely to vote by mail. Uh, but for places that do not have residential mail delivery, that's not a feasible option. and. Native Americans have to go out um, and interact with somebody anyway. And so we would rather that be in a controlled place, which like a polling location where you can actually account for people coming in to get the mail. Um, and we think that's a safer way. And also, you know, a necessary accommodation given their lack of residential mail delivery. So we're fighting with a bunch of counties right now 
to get them to um, have their in-person polling locations and might be seeking some emergency uh, relief shortly. Great. So, so at this point, though, you, you haven't filed litigation in those cases yet, but you're no. telling the counties, we will sue you if you attempt to do this. Yes. And Okay. And, and, your, and your basis for that claim would, again, be Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act. Exactly, yes. Right. So that, you know, you can have voting procedures that are neutral, but if they disproportionately impact a group um, and make it more difficult for them to vote, then that's not a legal, a legal you know, means of, of um, uh, a legal way to conduct your election. And so, um, you know, because Native Americans don't receive mail, that's not a legal way of, of conducting an election. Right. Okay. And, and Marina, what, what challenges are you confronting specifically related to this election? Sure. So we are um, supporting a number of um, cases on uh, vote by mail and um, wanting to make sure that, um, you know, obviously to the extent that, um, new, you know, vote by mail is being expanded in the states, um, A, we think it should be expanded. Um, also, early vote should be expanded. Um, but but to the extent that, that you know, um, states are doing mail mail in balloting. That you know that system is set up for success. So some of the problems and high rates of ballot rejection that we see are based on uh, some policies that are not necessarily sort of tied to outcomes. So for example, um, the signature matching process in a number that a number of states have are you know done by laypersons and not necessarily um, tied to better outcomes right so arguing um, uh, particularly with respect to the mail delays um, we have a, a US Postal Service lawsuit uh, we just won a preliminary injunction against the Postal Service uh, earlier this week which is early this week which is yesterday <laughs> yes sense of time is and really this, crazy and this was about the this was about the change in postal service um delivery and pickup practices that has been in the news a lot right the, that was implemented by the trump administration okay so us, tell us a little yeah. bit about that so so yeah certainly you've seen this in the news um earlier this year uh over the summer when um louis DeJoy became postmaster general and started implementing a number of uh, policy changes um among those he um limited the ability for uh postal workers uh, at, at three different points in the process to make uh, late trips. So as the mail is moving through the process from sorting facilities to, you know, to the post office, to, out to, um, you know, to deliveries, if a, if a piece of mail or a, a whole delivery of mail gets to its next place, you know, after the time it's supposed to be there, um, the, the, the postal workers are not, are now, have now not been allowed to sort of make extra trips or to, to sort of go back out. Um, and, you know, we, we um, uh, got, some expert opinion, ex expert declaration in those cases to show sort of the uh, the reduction of service that was caused by that policy change, and so that that led to an injunction um, that we just won against uh, that policy against the the ban on um, extra or late trips, um, and that you know because it 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 that prohibition happened at three different um, points in in time in the, the sort of life cycle of a piece of mail you could end up having that policy in and of itself could delay one piece of mail on average by three days. Wow. So when you think about, you know, the, the timeline that as people, more and more people, you know, I think now um, 83 or 84% of uh, Americans are at least entitled to vote by mail in this upcoming election. And um, many of them will choose to do so uh, because we are in a pandemic. Um, and, you know, you sort of, Aggravate, this is just aggravating a system that is already being stressed by, by the realities that we're living in. And so, you know, what we're trying to do is, is to extend, uh, for example, the, the time that um, a ballot can, can be received. And so as long as you put your mail in, your, your ballot in the mail on time, your ballot should count. Um, and so in different states, the sort of ballot receipt deadline is different. And, and um, one of the biggest challenges um, that I think we will see between now and then, uh, now in the election, is um, an attempt to have, uh, I think that's gonna be a particular um, point of tension. And, and um, I think the Trump campaign has already started trying to, uh, they filed, a, a, actually, um, they, they filed two collateral attacks um, on consent decrees that we won, in one in Minnesota and one in North Carolina, 
um, negotiating at arm's length in good faith with the state elect election officials. Um, they are now, they've filed collateral attacks in federal courts. Um, the agreements have been made in state court. Um, and they are arguing that um, the state election official does not have the authority to, to enter into these agreements um, and that only state legislatures have the authority to, um, to do anything respecting election laws. Um, so I think we're gonna see some pretty big questions being sorted out, um, uh, you know, some, some big constitutional questions. Uh, so it's, you know, the sort of lawyer nerd constitutional law, it, person is like excited and then and the question could you um either you say say a little bit more about the how the election system actually works right it's one of those it's kind of like a shadow area of law i don't think a lot of people know a lot about you know who actually makes decisions about uh polling places and uh ballot disqualification rules and all of that stuff is it the state is it the county is it the city is it some other locality or some other decision making body how does that process work um either either of you or both Jacqueline, well, I, how about you try speak a little bit about my experience and sort of my surprise when i entered this field at how much decision making authority goes to county officials um and how much power they just yield uh you know in this uh, way where you know, they get to decide where they're putting their polling locations in their counties. They're, they get to decide, uh, you know, a lot of um, provisions. Um, you know, the state will set uh, some guidelines sometimes, right? So they, they'll have, you know, sometimes they'll have population thresholds, which we find problematic, but, you know, like on uh, you know, where it's necessary to have a polling location. And so they'll have certain requirements as to how many polling locations per population. Of course, that doesn't really help if you know, you get lumped in with another population and they decide to have your polling place really far from you, right? Um, and the county official has the ability to make that decision. Um, the, there's also, you know, the state can also set a lot of um, rules around, you know, the, 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 just the time, place, and manner of voting, right? So um, the time itself is, you know, the federal government sets the day of uh, the election, but, you know, the early voting period, um, you, there's some litigation or there's some rules over how long that, er that early voting period um, can be, but, you know, they, the state can decide how long that, that early voting period is going to be within their state. They have the power to move all to vote by mail. They have the power to um, uh, enact a lot of, um, a lot of rules about how how you vote, you, you know, how you qualify or don't qualify over, uh, you know, for an absentee ballot, what types of identification you have to show. Those are all state mandated rules um, that usually come from the le legislature and are um, enforced by the state, uh, by the, the um, election official, you know, so they're usually the Secretary of State is the one that is the primary official. But then that Secretary of State delegates a whole bunch of the authority uh, to the local county, you know, the county auditor um, that will make a lot of the on the ground decisions. And there's not a ton of accountability um, when it comes to uh, those the decisions that those county officials make. Okay, so let, let me just pick up on that intent. So tell me if this is a, a correct characterization that a lot of the litigation that that you guys are involved in, and Jacqueline, in particular, you is is involved with. You're, you're challenging a change that has a detrimental effect uh, on a on a population's or group's ability to to engage in a political process, right? And that can be a a change in the in the voting rules, or in Marina, in your case, it can be a change in districting rules. Uh, but you're trying to stop bad stuff from happening. But and and. Well, I will say that sometimes no, because of how long these the the it's been bad in Indian country. Okay. So these aren't necessarily changes. These are just sometimes it's highlighting the dis, the the dis, dis, discrepancies that have been hap happening for a long time. Well, that's okay. Well, that's actually my yeah. question. Is so sometimes yeah. you're trying to 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 negate changes that you think are yeah. bad. Sometimes, and yeah. Other times you're you're trying to to highlight long-standing problems. Right. And then in the situation we're in now with COVID, you maybe also have the situation of, of thinking that there should be changes that would be necessary 
to make voting a reality now because of this you know, unprecedented situation we're, we're living through. Um, so can you talk about the, the, the difficulties with those latter two categories of cases, either longstanding things that you think have always been problematic, but they've been that way a long time, versus new changes that you think should come about, but that jurisdictions may not want to implement. Uh, and, and for example, I'm thinking about early voting uh, is something that I've always wondered why we can't have more early voting, uh, especially in a time like now. Uh, you know, how, how uh, what are the legal challenges you, you confront there? I don't know why we can't have more early voting. I think we should have more early voting. Oh, right, right. And, and, and the question is, how do you compel people who don't want that, right? Who don't want that? Is there is there a legal basis for compelling people who, who don't want that? Is the Voting Rights Act helpful in getting people to do stuff that they haven't done before? Or is it most helpful simply in negating bad changes uh, that would make things worse? I could give a quick answer, and I'm sure Marina's got a lot on there, too. Um, just it's both. It's certainly both. I mean, when there's a quick change that comes about, so when North Dakota tried to implement their voter ID law, yes, we use Section 2 to say, hey, you can't do this. But like in Nevada, for example, for a long time, Native Americans didn't have on reservation polling locations and had to travel miles and miles and miles to get there. Uh, and so we brought us, uh, we didn't, well, we supported a Section 2 litigation um, there to say, hey, you know, uh, that there's been this disparate impact on this Native American community for a long time, and you're obligated to change um, your election procedures uh, so that there is an on-site, in-person polling location um, in on the reservations. Um, so you can use it, you know, both ways. Um, yeah. Okay. And how how about the the um, uh, early voting? Is that uh, is that something that that you using it when using your tools as a lawyer can bring about or is that something we should just pursue through the political process i think there, there are opportunities to challenge particularly in this environment you know bringing um an as applied challenge right so you can you can bring a constitutional claim that is sort of specific to your context and i think that has been particularly helpful this year which is to say listen you know the the state legislature is you know yes has the authority to to make these laws and enforce them in a normal environment but but you know because uh, the state is also implementing um, policies to keep people healthy and keep people safe um, because we are in a global pandemic. You, you can't apply the same rules because when you apply the same rules, then you're burdening the right to vote in a way that is unconstitutional. And so the argument becomes in these very specific contexts, in this very specific moment um, for these very specific elections and with these very specific plaintiffs, it is unconstitutional for you to enforce um, the laws as they are written right now because it's too burdensome and it puts people people's health at risk. And so, you know, that's a big part of what what we've been um, grappling with is is trying to you know pursue cases where you're saying you know fine if this this is not going to be changing the laws forever, but for 2020, this is how we have to do it. Okay, so let, let me be sure I'm I'm tracking that because that that seems to be a challenging argument to make a constitutional claim. Uh, compelling a change now of uh, practices that have been long standing based on unusual circumstances now is that is that is, is that claim as challenging as i'm imagining it is or We've been we've been um, pursuing claims uh, increasingly under um, the sort of Anderson Burdick uh, framework, and so it's a First and Fourteenth Amendment framework that that sort of has like a sliding scale um, uh, burden analysis. So if there is a if, if there is a heightened burden on the right to vote, then you have a heightened standard of review. If the burden on the right to vote is just smaller, um, then you have a lesser um, you know standard of review. In terms of is there a legitimate um, state interest at play in in sort of uh, uh, enforcing that policy? Um, you know, I, I do think it's it's hard, and that is that is sort of the 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 pushback that that we get in in many of our cases, which is that you know there are legitimate reasons for the state. You know, the state has a as a legitimate interest in having these policies in place. Um, I think one particular piece of it that that 
um, we are trying to identify is for some of these policies where, you know, the state interest is actually not that strong. So I mentioned earlier the, the signature matching. And so, you know, when you actually, you know, dig into this, even though these laws have been on the books for, for a long time, you know, when you actually start doing some analysis and talking to experts, um, and sort of running numbers over, you know, the, the, the amount of however amount of time that these laws have been in place, you start seeing, well, they're not actually sort of doing the thing that 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 the state is claiming that they are intended to do. And so you can sort of see more clearly that the just the state justification for having that law is not um, is not like really hefty. And so, you know, it doesn't out, outweigh the burden on the right to vote. Um, and, you know, another thing that Jacqueline mentioned um, is is the ballot collection, uh, which is a similar one. And, and, and one of the arguments that we've that we've uh, seen and that we've had to make is there was actually an, uh, the only instance um, that I can recall off the top of my head is a Republican operative in North Carolina who in the 2018 election actually did engage in this type of fraud um, and was caught and, <laughs> and the election was rerun. So, you know, you sort of like this, this boogeyman of like, oh, you can't do this because you're going to invite all this fraud. It's like, well, there are systems in place that work right. to stop that from happening. And, and, um, and, and the fraud was that they were filling out ballots for people and just... Or losing them, or I think, I, I forget what, it, or, you yeah. know, not turning them in. No, but I think they were actually changing it in the North Carolina. Yeah, they were, they were filling out other people's ballots. And right, they, and right. And, and that's, and is it, and it's, and it's, so the irony is that that was a Republican operative who actually engage in the fraudulent behavior, but right. now the ostensible uh, reactions to that are going to be uh, deployed to disadvantage uh, disproportionate Democratic voters. Uh, yeah, when, when, when that fraud took place, we all uh, got together and we're like, oh, time to gear up. Like, this is going to be such a pain because, you know, suddenly there's this one, you know, whenever there's one example of fraud yeah. in the billions of votes, you know, <laughs> um, that suddenly it becomes this huge thing. Uh, and, you know, we're seeing that play out. And we thought that that was going to play out. It's, it's not so okay. Wow. So um, let's, we have just a little bit of time left. Let's turn directly to this upcoming election. Uh, what are you, uh, I mean, my, my response whenever anyone wants a, you know, professional opinion as a law professor, I just say buckle your seatbelts. Um, but you could probably do a lot better than that. So what should we be anticipating? What do you think is going to happen? What's coming around the pike? What are you worried about over the next six or eight weeks uh, in regard to this election? Uh, uh, Jacqueline. Uh, well, it's such a big question. I was like, go Marina, you go for it. <laughs> um, so, I mean, I very narrowly focused for the next three weeks about because mm -hmm. on getting the in-person polling locations, mm -hmm. right? So for the next three weeks, I'm just trying to make sure that when somebody shows up, they'll have the opportunity to cast their ballot, mm -hmm. right? I think that's kind of where my immediate attention is. And then we're going to shift to the actual, you know, results and we'll shift to, um, you know, the idea that the maybe uncomfortable idea for people that elections aren't decided on election night mm -hmm. and that there is a period of time where people lawfully cast their ballot on election day and yet it takes time to both count those ballots and it takes time for those ballots to be received um, in an election uh, office and so that those the function of those two things being that there will be a period of time um, that is expected and uh, that you know that that will delay the outcome and that it's not nefarious just by virtue of the fact that there is a delay. Um, and that errors uh, to the extent that they occur are often uh, found and <laughs> remedied, right? So that, you know, if there is an imperfect process, there's, uh, there are means to challenge, uh, you know, counts. There are means to have, uh, you know, bipartisan people present when those ballots are being counted. Uh, there are, you know, places uh, for and checks that occur um, in our system to make sure that the ballots are counted correctly. Um, and I, and I, I guess my one view is that 
or, you know, my personal view, I'd say, not necessarily in any other capacity, is that I'm waiting for whatever new thing, new argument is going to um, come up to try to delegitimize the process. Because I think there's been this slow roll of, um, well, or, or a bombardment, I don't know, just of, of you know, different ways of, of that the process is, is not legitimate, right? Um, and anybody that's in this space recognizes them as red herrings and we're able to say, no, like, in fact, you know, let me tell you all the ways in which that's incorrect, right? Um, and it's not, it, and it takes a while to educate the, the, the public on a very mundane point that elections aren't decided on election night, right? Like those are kind of things that are just known and yet we have to both educate the public and beat back sort of the wild claim that if uh, the d election isn't decided on election night, somehow it's illegitimate. Um, and I expect that there will be another wild claim uh, based on whatever set of circumstances uh, come out in the next couple of weeks that they will try and hang their hats on to say, that this process is not legitimate and therefore should not be uh, fully considered. And I think that, uh, so I'm just sort of waiting with bated breath uh, as to what that will be. And then uh, sort of uh, trying to figure out what the best tools are to beat back whatever disinformation is put forth um, because uh, it is an education process. Okay, Marina? Um, well, Jacqueline, that, that was, uh, wonderfully put and very much more calmly than I normally do <laughs> when people ask this question. I am somewhere in between the, the that very thoughtful answer and the buckle your seatbelt. Um, the, the, someone recently asked and, and my answer was, was um, prepare for a very tense 10 to 12 days after uh, after election day. Um, I totally agree and have been um, long ringing the bell to anybody who will listen to me about the fact that we need, you know, and the media, like we need to be prepared for the fact that we're not gonna know the answer on election night necessarily. Maybe we do, uh, but 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 we need to be okay with the fact that, that there are sort of legitimate processes in place that we can trust um, that will need to play themselves out. Uh, that being said, um, I do think, you know, that, that we are some of these issues and some of what I think um, the Trump campaign is going to attempt um, are being forecast by some of what we're seeing in our active litigation. I think Could this you say a little bit more about that. What's the what's the I mean, give us give us the horror story outcome and then <laughs> tell us why that okay. really won't happen. Like what, what, what's the worst thing that could happen over the next several weeks? So, um, well, you know, I think one one aspect uh, that we haven't quite touched on is, um, of course, the vacancy on the Supreme Court, mm -hmm. um, the loss of uh, Justice Ginsburg, which is uh, uh, just tragic uh, on a number of levels. Um, uh, I, I do think so. You know, you have senators who are saying the election is going to be decided by the court. Um, so there's sort of that aspect of it, which is a little bit of a wild card. Um, I quite, haven't quite figured out, um, you know, sort of how how we land uh, that plane in particular. Um, but, you know, but, but I do think this big question that, that we are starting to see coming from the Trump campaign and from the RNC, the Republican National Committee and sort of similar um, uh, entities uh, on the right is um, whether um, you know, th they are starting to sort of tease out this argument that the state legislature, not the state government, the state legislature uh, is singularly uh, uh, granted the authority to um, certify or to, to appoint electors. So um, basically the, the sort of threat is if um, on election day, there is sort of the phenomenon that we anticipate where uh, lots of folks um, who are voting in person are perhaps uh, voting for uh, the president to be reelected and lots of folks who are using mail-in ballots and actually numerically more, a, a larger proportion of the um, populace of the of the electorate is using um, vote by mail that you have and, and the numbers sort of bear this out in terms of what we're seeing in polling and in and in um, polling around use of vote by mail is that a, a greater proportion of people who plan to vote in person plan to vote for the president and a greater proportion of people who plan to vote by mail plan to vote for Vice President Biden 
And so, you know, some people are calling it a blue shift or something, um, or I've also heard someone call it the red mirage on election day. Um, so, you know, there are some creative ways that people are talking about this, but the, but the point being that if there is a sense or if, if the numbers that are in the votes that can be counted on election day um, are, are in favor of President Trump, then the, a state whose legislature is controlled by Republicans, that those legislatures, those legislators would move to, by resolution, appoint the electors um, uh, to President Trump. And so basically saying, we, we have the authority to do this. And, you know, this, these, these ballots that are coming in after Election Day are per se fraudulent um, because, you know, who knows who collected them, who knows who's their, their mail, their, their voting. If it comes in eight days after election day, it's not because it was stuck in the mail. It's because someone voted after election day and that's illegal. And we have to assume that all of these ballots are illegal. Um, so you, you asked me to sort of um, catastrophize. So here I go. <laughs> so the question is, just, just to be clear, so the idea is that they would make a pronouncement that is incredibly difficult to, re to determine the will of the voters based on the ballot because there's so many irregularities and uncertainties, ambiguities there. So we're going to make a determination as a legislature that the will of the people of this state is to support candidate X. Right. And those electors would be pledged to that candidate. Right. Uh, so is that is that likely? I mean, can they do that? Is it likely to happen? How much should we worry about that? And, 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 and what can we do if, some, if the legislature, I mean, you can, so you think of a, a state like uh, the neighbor to my home state of Ohio, and you think of a state like Wisconsin, right, right where yeah. the legislature is much more Republican than the actual population, than the actual state itself. Sure. Uh, am I getting, is it unrealistic to imagine that could happen there? Uh, and if so, if it's not, what should we do about it? I don't think it's unrealistic. But uh, I, 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 this is, this is, again, my personal view, <laughs> uh, not to speak for my organization or, or anyone other than myself. I, I think that that's realistic. I think, you know, we're, we're seeing, you know, um, we're seeing the signs of it. They're, they're signaling what they're doing in, you know, what, what they're planning um, through these cases. They're already starting to make these arguments that, you know, they're, they're point pulling out. Um, you know, Article Two, the Electors Clause, is a, is a now an issue in our litigation. Um, the Guarantee Clause, so guaranteeing states the right to a republic Republican form of government. Um, uh, you know, that's becoming an issue in these cases. Um, so, you know, I, I I think it's very clear what what the sort of strategy is um, of of folks who are really really desperate to hold on to power. And, and Jacqueline, is, is you, you seem more optimistic in your comments. Your, your, your characterization of the issue is really that we have to convince people to accept the legitimacy of the election results, even though we might not know as we typically do on election night, right? It might take a little longer, and we want people to accept that. But Marina's suggesting that there could be an outcome that maybe isn't legitimate. Or, or... Oh, yeah, so, so I apologize if I was overly optimistic. Um... <laughs> No, you <laughs> agree with Jacqueline, for the record. I think that is the message that, that we need to share. Right. So I think that there are two conversations. There's the wonky conversation on how it is that they are going to make the moves to, the, to try and um, shift the outcome in a way that they want to, despite whatever it is that the election results are saying. Mm -hmm. And I think Marina like excellently encapsulated the legal strategy there, right? Mm -hmm. Which is to delegitimize incoming mail-in ballots mm -hmm. and make it seem like, um, you know, that the, like the state legislatures have the, um, the, the uh, not just the authority, but the, they have the duty, right? The responsibility to certify those results in a way that they want, right? Um, and I think that what I was trying to say is that this larger PR battle that's happening is happening um, around uh, at, a, at, a, at a thousand foot level instead of that granular level to say that what they're trying to say is that vote by mail is illegitimate. And so therefore, um, when we do these machinations down the road, that that's a logical outcome and just outcome from what it is that we've been setting up here. And so I do think in a lot of ways, it's a PR campaign to say, no, 
right, that there is a legitimate um, process that's taking place and that any attempt to circumvent that legitimate process is illegitimate and, uh, you know, and that that's that so like, you know, whatever those machinations machinations are, um, whatever it is that however they appear that they are not in fact legitimate. Um, and that's really hard to do when uh, entire, you know, pop half of a population is, uh, is consuming news that doesn't actually comport with, um, you know, a reality uh, legally or factually. Right, right. So there's a, so there's a big <laughs> public, so there's a big public education challenge there. Yeah. Uh, is there, is there a legal strategy that is relevant there or do we have any legal tools to, to counteract these shenanigans? Hard it when the judges have, you know, the Supreme Court has expressed hostility to voting rights, right? I mean, I think that what's alarming and what's most tragic about Justice Ginsburg's death is that there is not a strong stalwart, there's not the, the there's a belief um, that voting rights um, are not, um, I don't know, they're not as, uh, as, uh, as, as I previously thought that they were, right? I, they are not as enshrined in our American democracy as I had previously thought that they were um, as untouchable. You know, the notion that it is literally impossible for some people to comply with vote, of voting mechanisms is not enough to compel um, these justices that the outcome is unjust. And I don't know how to argue around that. But you've definitely taken a turn away from optimism now. Yes, yes, yes. yes. I, I want to dissuade the idea that I was being overly optimistic. Okay. Maybe I was trying to get my PR hat on and, you know, leave that. But in, in this world, I, I, I'm, I'm not optimistic. But I do, I do think that there's a chance that it'll go the other way, that there's, a, that there's an overwhelming consensus, and then those, machin those machinations won't have an outlet. Um, I think that's the most plausible way for this not to be messy. But if it is close, then there is going to be a dogfight. Let me, let me throw out a, a bit of optimism. You can tell me if you think this is, is, is unrealistically optimistic. But the Supreme Court, now when we had Bush v. Gore, uh, Supreme Court was criticized for that decision, right? That was a case which I think most people know where the, the court basically uh, issued an order to stop the counting in Florida, uh, which had the effect of handing the election to George W. Bush, uh, the Republican candidate. Uh, now, uh, confronted with this, a, a, a similar scenario, uh, my sense is that the court would be much less uh, inclined to hand the uh, election to President Trump, uh, precisely because we are already so polarized and there has already been so much discussion about the potential uh, politiz politicization of the court. Uh, President Trump, if Amy Coney Barrett is, is confirmed, will have made three appointments to the court. Um, and that if you're at all concerned as a justice about the legitimacy of the court and how it's viewed in the public imagination, you in fact would bend over backwards uh, to be fair and neutral and impartial and to not create an appearance of partiality. Uh, so we should have great faith, right, that the court would not decide something in a way that the political alignments might, might suggest. Is, is, is that naive or is that, is that plausible? And you can tell me that I'm naive about it. I, I think that that might have some sway with John Roberts, right? Mm -hmm. Chief Justice John Roberts. And I think that there's a chance that he uh, would have been persuadable. But now that um, there are four votes the other way, then I think that he is he doesn't want the, 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 the legitimacy argument, I think, right? If half the court's voting one way, right, and uh, then it, the, unless the decision's unanimous, there's going to be this feeling like the decision isn't uh, legitimate or that it's politicized anyway. Mm -hmm. And I think that he would then just throw his vote in the way that he would have initially been inclined to anyway. And that politicize, politicization argument is already lost. And I think that, you know, um, and in any event, I think that... Um, the problem is that is not, not 
it, this argument of legitimacy is only salient insofar as the public can hold uh, the court accountable for illegitimate acts. And if there's half the population, again, that is not receiving the uh, message that this was a um, flex, uh, you know, unconstitutional flex of judicial power that undermines the institution, um, then that point is lost. And I think that's probably what's going to happen. Yeah, I, I, I get very nervous that um, I think uh, we all, because we have to at this point, put a little bit too much um, faith in Chief Justice Roberts. I think he is, uh, I think, you know, self-described as, a, a, you know, wants to be an institutionalist. I think, you know, some of our, uh, the, the royal we sort of wins on um, the census and some of, you know, um, uh, some recent sort of uh, court victories um, on the APA on just the, the fact that the current administration is um, just bad at governing. Um, you know, I think that he has been, you know, more of an institutionalist in that way. And thank goodness, I mean, honestly, um, because because I think there have been some some big wins based on, you know, the Administrative Procedure Act and and some of these sort of procedural issues where, you know, adherence and and fealty to the way that, you know, our government is supposed to operate is is important and he declares that that's important. Um, I think that he has shown himself to be quite hostile to voting rights generally. Um, I think, you know, Shelby County is is uh, particularly one that sticks out. Um, certainly, Citizens United uh, was problematic. Um, you know, I, the Rucho, the partisan gerrymandering case. Um, you know, I think I think that um, when push comes to shove, he has 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 not shown himself to be. Um, you know, shy away from from making decisions. Um, there's also the the he is a. Uh, penned a dissent in a in a case back in 2015 or 2016 over the Arizona um, uh, redistricting commission. Uh, you know that that was um, the majority opinion written by Ch Justice Ginsburg. Um, you know, and and we're going to be dealing with some of those same questions about you know things that that redistricting commissions are doing in the next couple of years. So, you know, I think. I think he 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 wants to wear this hat of ins, of being an institutionalist, and I think a lot of folks put their hopes in him that he will live up to that um, uh, uh, that he will li live up to that aspiration. I think that you know I think that when you actually look at the decisions that he he's made with respect to voting rights, it's very clear that he is not um, wow. a friend. And, I, and I'll just add, right? Like I, just, I forgot, right? We're 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 arguing the old system where Justice Ginsburg was still alive. Right. Like now, the math they they. There's no other institutionalist, I think, that would subscribe to that view. And so they don't even need, we don't even need Roberts. I mean, they don't, you know, Roberts right. can cast his okay, so it's, it's, it's 2 p.m. We have to end. <laughs> do you have 15 seconds? What should students do? Any uh, advice? Vote early. <laughs> yep, vote early. And um, make sure your ballot is dropped off uh, in a ballot collection box or at a county seat. Try not to, you know, you can use the mail, but I would, I would uh, try and vote early. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I mean, not only for, for joining this conversation, but really for the work you're doing, because this is some of the most important work to be done to help keep democracy alive. It's, democracy is one of those things that you can have it, and sometimes we forget that you can lose it if you don't protect it. So thank you. Take down Carlin's class. I didn't take it, and it's the biggest mistake of my life. <laughs> yes, good advice. Good advice. Yeah. And, and, that, and reach out if you want to do, yeah. Externs, interns, summer, uh, we're, we're, we're here and have, and I'm also like coffees, I guess not, not coffees now, but you know, virtual chit chats. <laughs> we, we will continue the conversation. Thank you so much. That ends Thank today's you. program. Thank you.